Hey, Flipside. Thanks for joining me for Bible study. Uh, what I'm going to do is teach as if uh, we're at my Wednesday night Bible study uh, so that you can follow along and and participate with your small group. Um, I'll pose some questions as I teach. Uh, we'll try our best to have some questions online in a PDF format for you. But I just want to invite you into my Bible study uh, so we can keep some type of connection together. You know, the word right now is social distancing. I, I think maybe let's start reframing that and talking about location distancing, but social togetherness. And so uh, in an effort to be together socially in Bible study, I'm going to produce these once a week. Um, and I'm just inviting you to jump in with us. We've been um, going through, we started in 1 Samuel, went through 2 Samuel, went through 1 Kings, now we're in 2 Kings. Uh, and just following uh, God's story as he as he continues to move and to act through people. And so uh, I got my Bible here, and I'm just going to go through it uh, as, as we move through this. And so you're going to follow along. Second Kings, we're going to finish out chapter 6. I'm going to try to keep this to about, I don't know, 20 to 30 minutes at most. Um, and we'll just get through whatever we get through. But let me pray first. Father, thank you for uh, the opportunity to open up your word. Thank you that uh, through your Holy Spirit that you are with us, uh, that you remain with us, and that you draw us together uh, in uh, connection and in communion with you and with each other, even, even online. Thank you for the technology that allows us to do this. Father, I thank you that as your word says that you are active and alert, watching over your word to perform it. So perform it now. Do what it intends to do in us. Uh, uh, thank you for that. We look forward in advance with confidence and assurance uh, to how you're going to speak to us as we open up your word and ultimately how you are uh, destroying this virus that keeps us separated and ruins lives. And so thank you in advance for what you're about to do. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, so we've been in 2 Kings 6, and um, the king of Aram has been waging war against God's people. Ben-Hadad is his name. And uh, Elisha is now the prophet of God, took over from Elijah. Uh, and Elisha uh, is with his servant, um, they they were by physical numbers. Uh, ben Hadad's the king of Aram. His army was surrounding them. His servant was petrified. It's so interesting in my mind the parallels between what was going on in Scripture in this time and what we're going through right now. His servant was petrified because of this army that was surrounding him um, and didn't see any way out. Didn't see any hope. And and Elisha said, "Don't be afraid." Um, verse 16 of 2 Kings 6, he said, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Uh, it was hard for the servant to understand what Elisha was saying because the servant was just looking through his physical eyes and he didn't have spiritual eyes yet to see what Elisha was talking about. But Elisha knew uh, that, that, that there was a God with him who was the, uh, who was com in command of the armies of heaven. Uh, and in verse 17, Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. You know, I think back to when Elijah was, was taken up to heaven. The Bible says he was taken up in a whirlwind, not a chariot of fire, but that the chariot of fire and chariots of fire were around him. When they, I think back to that account, and God once again sends his armies uh, and full of horses and chariots of fire. It allows the servant's eyes to be open. The servants of Elisha's eyes see uh, this army that's around them, and all of a sudden he's, uh, he's okay. Once he gets a perspective of God, and once he gets a perspective and his spiritual eyes are open to see what God is doing around him, then he's okay. So anyway, long story short, strikes the, the armies of the king of Aram, uh, Ben-Hadad, uh, strikes his armies with blindness. Elisha leads them into the city of the king that they were originally trying to go after. Um, commands the king to treat them nice rather than to kill them. Um, abides by what we will learn about later in 
uh, in the New Testament that if you want to really uh, be God's follower, you re return evil with goodness, which is really, really hard. Um, and so because they, re they, they responded, they did good to those who were going to hurt them, harm them. The Bible says in verse 23 that they prepared a great feast for all these guys that were trying to hunt them down. And after they finished eating and drinking, they sent them away. Uh, and the Bible says that the bands of Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. So that seemed to be, at least at this point, the, when, when, when the warring stopped between the, the king of Aram, Ben-Hadad, ben and, and God's people until the next verse. <laughs> so picking up in 2 Kings 6, verse 24, the Bible says sometime later after after they had had this experience, after they had received kindness and goodness um, from those that they were out to harm, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, mobilized his entire army and marched up, marched up and laid siege to Samaria. It amazes me that how quickly we forget what God has done, what God is capable of. Um, and, 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 and that's, that's both the... the there's blessing and miracle and there's danger in it because there's blessing in it because i mean when god steps in and intervenes and does something it's amazing but the danger if you live off a miracle without question the hype of it's going to wear off um and just like everybody has done you soon forget what the Lord has done, what the Lord's capable. If we didn't forget what the Lord has done or what the Lord is capable of, we would never doubt him. But we do because we forget. Verse 25, there was a great famine in the city because they laid siege to it. And the siege lasted a lo so long, and get this, so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver. That's two pounds of silver. And a quarter of a cab of seed pods for five shekels. Let me explain what that means. The famine, Ben Hadad's army set siege around the around the city, and it was so bad that God's people were starving to death. That the head of a donkey, so a donkey dies, it cut off its head. The, the only thing you're going to do with a dead donkey head is boil it. So they're going to boil a dead donkey head. It, it's amazing because a donkey was an unclean animal. As far as as far as uh, their dietary laws were concerned, but they were in such bad shape, they were willing not only to transgress on the law, but they were going to pay two pounds of silver for a dead donkey head. What's there to eat in a dead donkey head? The eyeballs, the brain. Like you're going to boil it and get whatever you can out of the skull. It just is nasty. And then a, a cab of seed pods for five shekels. Now that's a nice way of saying it. this is bird poop. Like they were going to sell bird poop, dove dung. Now I don't think they were eating it, but I think they were using it as as fire starter to boil the water so they could eat a dead donkey head. Now, you understand how bad this is. The Bible says in verse 26 of 2 Kings 6, as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out. She said, help me, my lord, the king. So the king's walking around assessing the damage and how bad things are. And a woman calls out to him. She cries for help. And the king replied, verse 27, if the Lord doesn't help you, what can I do for you? I mean, at least he acknowledges that his effort, his human effort is of no consequence nor avail. He said, if God isn't going to help you, we got no help. He says, am I going to go to the threshing floor or the wine press? And I said, what's the matter? In my mind, I go back to Gideon in Judges uh, 6. And the Bible says he was threshing wheat in the wine press. Now, here's, here's, why, here's why this is significant. You threshed wheat. That's when you separated the wheat from the chaff. You usually did that out in the open, usually on the crest of a hill so the wind could blow through. And as you throw the throw the, the, the wheat up in the air and the, all the nasty chaff stuff blows away in the wind and comes back right And then once you've got it separate, then you go down into the valley where the wine press is and then you, you know, tread it out. 
And, uh, and so the interesting thing with Gideon is that he was threshing wheat, which still up on top on a hill down in the valley. Why? Because he was afraid of the Midianites that were all around him going to attack him. So I, I think the king's probably drawn on some of that history. And he goes, look, it don't matter. You, you go to the heights, you go to the depths. We got no help. You, you go up to where you're supposed to do this. You go down to where, like there's no help around anywhere. But he asked her, what's, what's the matter? What's the problem? This is one of the most gruesome accounts of life, um, in my opinion, in ancient literature and current literature. This is just, what's going on here is, is just the most horrific thing you could ever imagine. Listen to what she says. She answered, this woman said to me, give up your son so we may eat him today and tomorrow we'll eat my son. I, I'd rather, I'd rather give myself up than, I just can't even imagine. It's not, nobody believes that these moms killed their child for food. That's not what's going on here. I mean, what's going on is bad enough. That That's not, what's likely happened is that these kids died because of starvation. And they're in such, I can't even imagine being in that place. Um, and she says, verse 29, so we cooked my son and ate him. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. The next day I said to her, give up your son so we may eat him. But she had hidden him. You understand how bad this is right here for these people. Verse 30, when the king heard the woman's words, he tore his robes. And as he went along the wall, people looked at him, and there underneath he had sackcloth on his body. Sackcloth was, was stuff made of real coarse, like goat hair. It was really, really terrible to put next to your skin. And they did it as a sign of the deepest of remorse and grief. In verse 31, he said, May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if the head of Elisha, son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. So he basically says, look, this man of God, Elisha, is the one that encouraged us to let these guys go and return evil for, or return return the evil they were going to do with good. Had we just killed them when we had the chance, maybe they wouldn't have laid siege us and we wouldn't be in such a bad spot. And basically he says, look, man of God, this is all your fault. And he says, may the Lord deal with me ever, be, be it ever so severely. For I just head isn't on his body at this time, tomorrow, uh, you know, later today. This is interesting. He says of Elisha nearly word for word what his mother said about Elijah. His mother was Jezebel. Uh, and she said the almost this exact same thing about Elijah. The interesting thing to me is this. The difficulty that was going on in Elijah's time that Jezebel was referring to and the difficulties going on in the king of Israel's time with this siege, that wasn't Elijah's fault. This isn't Elisha's fault. God was very clear. You go back to Deuteronomy 28. God was very clear that when you abandon me and worship other gods, and you give your allegiance to other things other than me, it's going to go bad. It will cost you your life. It'll cost you your kids' lives. And you will starve in this land. Now get this. They're in the land that originally was a land flowing with milk and honey. It was a land of prosperity. It was the greatest land in the world, the greatest opportunity, the greatest prosperity. And now it's so bad, they're going to boil a dead donkey head and use bird poop for fuel and it's going to get so bad they're going to bury or boil dead children. And it's not the man of God's fault. It's the fact that they abandoned God and God gave them over to the degradation and destruction that he said he would. It was their fault. So verse 32, Elisha was sitting in his house and the elders were sitting with him. The king sent a messenger ahead. But before he arrived, Elisha said to the elders, don't you see how this murderer is sending someone to cut off my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold it shut against me. He said, don't let this guy in. 
because his master's right behind him. And he wants to kill me for what's going on. While he was still talking to them, the messenger came down to him and the king said to him, this disaster is from the Lord. Why should I wait on the Lord any longer? The king says, look, this is coming at God's hand. Why should I wait on God any longer? He hasn't done anything. He hasn't intervened. He hasn't showed up. He hasn't helped us. He's obviously either unaware of how bad it is or he doesn't care. I'm done waiting on him. It's surprising me sometimes how similar we are. Because there are times, if we're honest with ourselves, where we get to the point of saying, God, I've waited on you long enough. I, I feel as though things continue to get bad. They continue to go wrong. They continue to be difficult. And you don't, you just let it keep going. I'm done waiting on you. Um... It, it, we get to the point where we just don't want to wait any longer. And so we do foolish things like take matters into our own hands, use our own wisdom, our own judgment. We ask people around us what they think we should do. And, 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 and all the time, I mean, God has given us plenty of instruction and plenty of, okay, here's, we just don't want to wait. If I could have titled this little section of Bible study anything, I would have titled it, uh, don't doubt God's word. Time and time again, God is always faithful to his word. And so pick it up, chapter 7, verse 1. Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, a sea of flour, about seven quarts of flour, is going to sell uh, for a shekel, two-fifths an ounce. At, at the gate of Samaria. A sea of barley is going to sell for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The, like prices are going to plummet. When you're paying two pounds of, of silver for a dead donkey head to boil, and then all of a sudden within a day, seven quarts of flour, of the finest flour is going to sell for one shekel. I mean, it's nothing. Like he's saying, what he's saying here is that your fortunes are going to completely reverse and not just reverse to what they were. They're going to reverse so much. You're going to come out so far ahead in a day. I mean, it's like, boom, all of a sudden tomorrow, it'll be like someone saying, look, you're going to wake up tomorrow. There's going to be no trace of the coronavirus and the stock market is going to double what it was at 29,000 is going to be up at whatever 29 times two is. I don't know. What was that? That's a whole bunch. 58,000. I mean, it would just be it's that type of thing. It's like a ridiculous. And so the officer, verse two, on whose arm the king was leaning and said to the man of God, look, even if the Lord should open a flag, it's a heaven. Cause that really happened. Like even if God were to step in, it, it ain't going to happen that way. You hear what he's saying there. Like he's questioning, not just questioning, he's doubting God at his word. And not just God at his word, he's doubting God at his ability. Like even if God shows up himself, this ain't going to happen this way. And so Elisha answered, and this is what we got to understand. You'll see it with your eyes, but you ain't going to eat any of it. He said, you're going to see it happen, but you're not going to experience it yourself. It's a warning. You don't doubt God's word, you'll doubt his power. Now there were four men, verse three of chapter seven, living a uh, four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. Okay, so it, 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 according to the law, lepers couldn't enter the city; they had to stay outside the city. So, so some of them are still abiding by the law. It's interesting. They were the lepers. Um, they were sitting by outside the entrance of the city. They were sitting by the city gate, and they said to each other, "Why wait here till we die?" Why just sit here till we die? Like we got leprosy is bad enough. And now everybody's starving and we're outside the city trying to be obedient. But why sit here till we die? I love that attitude. The problem is that most people live with the opposite of that attitude. They just sit around and wait to die. God didn't save us to die. He saved us to live. And so many people sit around in life just waiting to die. These lepers get it. We're, we're not going to sit here. Till, why sit until we die? Verse four. If we say, well, we'll go into the city. Well, the famine's there and we'll die there. But if we stay here, we're going to die here anyway. 
So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. Let's go to the enemy and let's surrender. And he says, if they spare us, we'll live. If they kill us, we're going to die anyway. So we got one shot. Let's give it what we got. Let's go over to the Arameans. We got leprosy. What do we got to lose? We're going to die outside the city. We're going to the city. There's family. We're going to die there. We got leprosy. We're going to die. Let's just go and see if they'll have mercy on us now. So at dusk, they got up and went into the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the camp, not a man was there. They'd all gone. For the Lord, here's what happened. For the Lord caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army, so that they said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and the Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and their donkeys. They left the camp as it was, all their provisions, all their food, everything, and they ran for their lives. Why? Because they heard the sound of horses and a great army. What horses and a great army? There was no horse and great army. They had all died in a famine. You know what they heard? You go back to 2 Kings 6, 17. The same thing that the servant heard when Elisha prayed his eyes would be open. The Lord opened the servant's eyes Chapter 6, verse 17. And he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire and Elisha. That's what God caused the enemy to hear. His army and his glory. And at hearing that, they were petrified and ran and left everything behind. Watch what happened. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp and entered one of the tents. They ate and drank and carried away silver and gold and clothes and went and hid them. Then they returned and entered another tent and took some of it uh, from it and hid it also. Then they said to each other, hold on now, what we're doing in right. This is a day of good news and we're keeping it to ourselves. They're saying, God has delivered all this stuff into our hand. He's so good and he's blessed us so much and we're hoarding it for ourselves. We're consuming it for ourselves. This is good news. And if we keep it to ourselves, we're doing wrong. Here's what I know. That when people simply consume God's provision for themselves, they're doing wrong. Share the good news and the blessings of God with others. And this is what so many Christians end up doing too. They got the good news of the gospel and they go to church and they consume it all and take it all and, 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 and absorb it all. And they don't think about sharing it. Like that's why you got the good news to share it with people. At least, I mean, the leper got it. What we're doing isn't good. This is good news. He says, if we wait until daylight, punishment will have taken us. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace. I wish we lived with that urgency. If we keep the good news and the blessings of that God has given us to ourselves, if we wait too long, punishment's going to overtake us. Man, the good news we have is not meant to be hoarded. God's blessings is not meant to be hoarded. God's provision is not meant to be hoarded. So quit hoarding the toilet paper and start giving stuff away and start spreading the good news. Verse 10, so they went and called out the city gate uh, to uh, out to the, the city gatekeepers and told them, we went to the Arameans camp. Not a man was there, not a sound of anyone. Only the horses and donkeys were tethered up. The tents were left where they are. The gatekeeper shouted that news, reported to the palace. The king got up when he heard it. He said, I'll tell you what the Arameans did. He said, they know we're starving. Verse 12, they know we're starving. They left the camp to hide in the countryside thinking we're going to come out. And as soon as we come out and investigate, they're going to overtake us and kill us. So verse 13, one of the officers uh, said, well, have some men take five horses that are left in the city. I guess they hadn't eaten five of them. <laughs> there were five left. Uh, their plight will be like that of the Israels if they left them. In other words, we leave these horses here, they're going to die anyway. So might as well try try to get something out of them and use them for something. So um, so send them to find out what happened. Verse 14, they selected two chariots with their horses, and the king sent them to the, after the Aramean army. He commanded the drivers, go and find out what happened. Verse 15, they followed them as far as the Jordan and found the whole road strewn with the clothing and equipment the Arameans had thrown away uh, in their headlong flight. So the messengers returned and reported to the king. Verse 16. Then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans. So they go investigate. It's just like the leper said. Stuff is everywhere. Not an enemy to be found. The Bible says, So a sea of flour sold for a shekel and two seas of barley sold for a shekel. And as the Lord had said. Don't doubt his word. 
It, it, he said it's going to happen. It might not happen like you thought it would, like that serpent said. Well, even if the Lord opens the heavens, it won't happen. Well, sure, he's got, a, he's got other plans. He's got other He's got other ways of getting stuff done than just the way we think it should happen, the way it's going to happen. Verse 17, now the king had put the officer on whose army had leaned in charge of the gate and the people tramp. So the king put the guy whose army was leaning on in charge of the gate. Well, the people are so anxious to go get this stuff. <laughs> this is sad. The people trampled him in the gateway and he died <laughs> just as the man of God said had foretold the king. Um, just like he said. Verse 18, it happened as the man of God said to the king about this time tomorrow, a sea of flour will sell for a shekel and two seas of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The officer had said, the Bible writes this, verse 19, to the man of God, look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of heaven, could this happen? You can question God and his word. The man of God replied, you will see it with your own eyes. Oh, he saw it. He saw it as they ran right over his face. But you will not eat any of it. Verse 20, and that's exactly what happened. The people trampled him in the gateway and he died. If I could title this Bible study anything, I would title it, Don't Doubt God's Word. When God speaks, his words aren't idle and they're not fluff. He knows exactly what he has said and he will accomplish exactly what he said he will do. And when you come across something in the Bible that God said, thus saith the Lord, this is what I have to say, bank on it. Bank on it. And this is why Christians can live with such incredible certainty and confidence, man. I mean, this stuff here, it's real, it's true. And it always comes to fruit. always comes to fruit. God says, I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. I'm going to get it done. So in these trying times, in these difficult times, rest assured on what God has already declared. It's going to happen. And you're going to get it done. You can bank on it. I love you, Flipside.